Welcome, everyone. This is the second session of um, Pitt's Center for Governance and Markets uh, virtual seminar entitled Networked Governance. How can we govern ourselves digitally? And so last week we heard from Will Luther talking about the difference between a distributed and decentralized payment mechanism, which ties in nicely to today's talk. But before we jump into the specifics of our guest and his topic, I wanted to hand it over to Jen for just a brief word about the Center for Governance and Markets and what it's all about. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. I'm Jen Murtazashvili. I'm the director of the Center for Governance and Markets here at the University of Pittsburgh, where I'm also an associate professor of public and international affairs. Um, we're really grateful to have this uh, seminar series this semester focused on network governance. I just wanted to let you know that we have two other seminar series running this semester. One is on the economics of race and identity. That's very much focused on the economic literature. And then another research, uh, another seminar on policing and police reform uh, in the United States. And that seminar series is moderated by uh, Brandon Davis at the University of Kansas, who's one of the country's top young scholars on police reform. So just uh, you know about our center, our mission is to understand the diverse institutions and governance arrangements that affect social order and human well-being around the world. We do this through cutting edge research, policy engagement, and community engagement. So without further ado, I just want to introduce, we're so fortunate to have Eric Alston stewarding us this semester uh, through all of these talks on um, on, uh, on network governance. And just a, a, a few words about Eric. He is uh, at the University of Colorado in the Leeds School of Business. He does such diverse research on everything from comparative constitutions to blockchains to property rights. And we're really fortunate to have him with us this week. So Eric, I'm gonna hand it, oh, not just this week, we have him this entire semester uh, moderating these discussions. So uh, Eric, I'm gonna hand it back off to you and you'll introduce our speaker, Nick. And we're Nick, we're so grateful to have you here with us today. And I should also mention that we had planned to have Nick host this seminar last spring. Uh, and he was gonna visit us from the UK in Pittsburgh in person. But of course, uh, his seminar was canceled due to COVID. So we're really fortunate to have him with us uh, today, even though it's late in the evening there in Blighty. Thanks. Great to be here. So, yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, those other those other virtual seminar series, to me, kind of round out what I see as a unifying theme between all three, which is critical institutions that we are continuously defining going forward in our society. So how racial outcomes map to economic outcomes or racial identity maps to economic outcomes police reform, especially given the recent events and the social turmoil surrounding policing practices and the really unfortunate outcomes, and our topic, which is digital governance. As the interactions of our world, especially our economic interactions, become increasingly digital, the way we govern these digital communities will only become of increasing importance to societies around the world. And so this seminar was organized around what are some of the cutting edge thoughts on digital governance, especially those implicated by the structure of permissionless blockchains. And so effectively, we survey a wide variety of takes on both blockchains as well as other pressing digital governance questions. And so Nick Cowan is a senior lecturer in criminology at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Lincoln. And his title today, as you can see on your screen, is Digital Decentralization by Design, Escaping the Paradox of Power. And just to briefly link it to last week's topic, for those of you who weren't here, we heard that Bitcoin is not a fully decentralized payment mechanism. And our scholar featured last week, William Luther, argued that it's best understood as a distributed payment mechanism that nonetheless relies on some measure of intermediation between individuals who want to transact and the, it, and the system that facilitates that transaction. But what's exciting and something we've heard a lot about and we'll continue to hear about this semester is innovation in these modes of digital governance. And so just because Bitcoin is perhaps not the perfectly decentralized payment mechanism that some people dreamed of it becoming, doesn't mean we can't move in that direction. Doesn't mean we can't actually develop 
through techniques of mechanism design or institutional design more generally, a better understanding of the trade-offs wrought by these governance institutions in digital communities. And so I see Nick's work as on the forefront of thinking through a lot of the both constitutional level questions, but also some of the nitty gritty political economic questions associated with these networks surrounding a blockchain structure. And so without any further ado, I will take it, kick it over to Nick with actually, sorry, one procedural question. So a change from last time. Anyone who was here last time, I said, hold your questions till the end. Afterwards, we're like, hey, we actually prefer the dynamism of academic seminars. And so please feel free to message me if you want to interrupt Nick just to provide for the seamlessness of the talk. And then I will flag for Nick, hey, we've got a question from so-and-so, and and then I'll let you ask your question. Don't worry, I don't need to paraphrase your question for you. All of you, by definition, I'm sure know your questions better than I do. And so please just shoot me a message in the chat box, which I'll be monitoring, and then I'll wait for Nick to finish his sentence or thought, and then jump in and say, hey, we've got a question from this individual, um, and we'll go from there. But of course, we intend for this to be a robust discussion. Last one's lasted past the scheduled 60 minutes. And so if you have other questions at the end of it, please venture them freely because we want this to be a fruitful discussion, both for participants as well as the presenter. And so without any further ado, I will kick it over to you, Nick. Oh, thanks very much, Eric. And, and thanks very much, Jennifer, for, for having me. It's really great to, to have um, an audience that's so engaged with these, these issues. And um, I suppose, uh, you know, following what, um, what Will Luther, um, uh, you know, has, has said, um, it, I think when it comes to these things, it's very important to think at the margin rather than thinking in a kind of maximal way. So I, th- I think um, decentralization happens in marginal incremental forms, uh, but nevertheless in very vibrant ways. Um, so I, 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 think, I think that's, that's the kind of the way to think about this. I'm gonna show you a few ways in which I think that um, uh, decentralization with blockchains can happen um, and also some uh, challenges to it. Ooh, now, let's see, oh, here we are, yeah. Now, I find when I'm looking at this topic, um, it's a little bit like watching Inception or, you know, kind of, I suppose back in the day, you know, kind of, um, looking at the matrix or something it's like every now and then you just look at things or rather someone presents you with a proposition that just seems so outlandish so crazy that it kind of inverts what you think how you think that um these systems can um uh, can can work and uh, often it actually is crazy and you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't touch it but sometimes it turns out to be something very interesting and uh, and i think some of this is going to turn out to be useful for businesses and then before too long useful for um, users, uh, you know, sort of ordinary users rather than the kind of hobbyists that are kind of looking at looking at this. Um, but because of this kind of inception like complexity, I like to give you an outline just in case I get lost or you get lost uh, during this kind of presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, protocols versus platforms um, and how uh, platforms have come to dominate. And as a result, I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to like um, beef on Facebook a bit, but that's only because, you know, they, they probably have worse PR than Google. It's not because of anything intrinsic to them, um, but uh, um, platforms behaving badly. And so why we might be looking towards um, a, uh, an ability to expand uh, the use of protocols. And I'm going to argue that blockchains seem to have a way of, uh, of, of doing this in a kind of way that just a few years ago we'd have thought would be completely impossible, almost conceptually very difficult to get our, our head around. Um, then I'm going to discuss some of the challenges that some of the emerging uh, protocols are facing. Um, and I've, I found it helpful to borrow um, a, uh, a recent phrase from uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, uh, the narrow corridor, and I've, I've got like an explanation for um, basically uh, the sort of two scissors that kind of uh, interfere with the, with the possibility of blockchains um, get, gaining, um, you know, basically developing properly and gaining um, a, a, a large consistent user base based on kind of credibility and reputation. And then I'm going to kind of uh, end it with a, um, with a recent case study, very recent in fact, because it's been unfolding over the last two or three weeks, um, and um, which I think illustrates a lot of the kind of challenges around trying to force uh, blockchain technologies into this narrow corridor where development becomes possible. Um, so, okay, so um, 
this is very much is almost my way of trying to think through the problem. Every time I kind of try and ad adopt this, I have to kind of try and take a step back, try and understand some technical ideas and, uh, and try and figure out where exactly we are in this space. Um, and I think this is the, the best way of kind of thinking through it and kind of bringing you guys hopefully along with me. So protocols, um, they are common data and communication standards. Uh, generally, they require skills and competence to use directly. And um, they're usually built by not-for-profit actors. Um, platforms, now these tend to be proprietary data and communication standards, they use them. They have this sort of walled garden effect, you know, when you're using something like, uh, you know, Apple or Google. Um, so generally, uh, when you're kind of operating in their space, you have a more attractive, you know, often more effective, faster, generally kind of nicer uh, kind of um, uh, user experience, but you have less user control. That's a kind of trade-off on, on the, the user side. Um, and they're usually owned by a for-profit uh, corporation. And I think it's very important, thinking at the margin here, um, that these things are not exclusive in any, in any um, sense. Uh, so platforms make a lot of use of protocols. Um, and at the same time, platforms often help develop common protocols, you know, partly uh, just because they need them and then they want other people to be able to access their platform, um, to be able to access the platform relatively easily. Um, and uh, sometimes just because it's, it's easier than trying to maintain proprietary technology, which they might need help supporting or what have you. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, neither of these uh, su supply purely private goods. They're supplying common goods, they're supplying public goods, and uh, goods with various network effects. Um, so, you know, so classic in, in the kind of internet space is, is sort of two-sided markets. Um, and um, if you're ever in a space where you're not paying for something, and you're kind of a little bit confused what's going on, you've got you to think there's another side to the market somewhere that's paying, that's paying for it. And if you're not paying for it, um, paying for anything, then they're paying for you. So that's, that's uh, you've got to watch out for these two-sided marks. It's not always obvious what's going on. Um, and I think just to illustrate my point, um, I think, you know, the sort of simplest way of thinking about this is, um, you know, the classic email, uh, which has been running since the 70s in various forms, and uh, versus sort of Gmail, which, you know, to be fair, I, I hardly look at actual email anymore as a user. I kind of know what it is, but I'm interacting with it through basically either Microsoft or Gmail as it happens. Um, so email, you know, it's based on a common set of protocols. Uh, it's fairly insecure. Uh, there's plenty of spamming and phishing. Uh, it's mostly uncensored. Um, can be quite slow, depending on what's sort of going on in, this, in your kind of network space. There's some expense to run um, as a single user or an independent organization, you know, just ask your university IT um, uh, uh, support, um, support group to, to find out what, 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 what they have to do to run it. Um, and it requires specialist knowledge or support to run consistency. Basically, spamming and phishing, if you don't have anything else going on in your network space, you're going to end up with a very, very full um, uh, inbox, most of which you don't want to see and some of which is kind of dangerous. Um, so you, you need some help to kind of run, to kind of use that protocol as a kind of like base user. Um, compared with Gmail, which has many proprietary elements, it tends to keep users at arm's length of open protocols. You can access it, I think, if you look through the settings, you can figure out what's actually going on, but you often don't have to because you have a very beautiful app on your phone. You have everything kind of all set up, laid out for you already. So actually, your interaction can be with Google. Google can handle the protocol for you. Um, and uh, it's, as a result, it's much more secure. Um, you know, Gmail has amazingly sophisticated spam and phishing detection. Um, it lets most of the stuff that you need through. Occasionally, someone has to ring you up and say, can you check your spam? But generally speaking, most of the stuff in your spam box is, is spam. It's meant to be there. And most of the stuff that, um, you know, kind of knows who your friends are and tends to kind of let, let the important stuff through. Um, of course, as a result, it's easier to censor and filter. Is generally faster than email, especially if, for example, because uh, many people have Gmail accounts, communicating from Gmail account to Gmail account is virtually instantaneous. It's very easy to use and it's very frequently upgraded. So if you just think about the way that Gmail integrates seamlessly with Google's storage system and also its video conferencing system, you can just set up a meeting immediately. That's the kind of advantage of a, of a platform. And it costs nothing except your soul. Uh, or more precisely, the platforms that you're dealing with grab extremely detailed personal data. Um, 
And I think the, the takeaway here is that platforms have more resources to supply, you know, frankly, better products than what um, the protocols that are upgraded only very occasionally uh, can, can deliver. Um, in order to do that, they must harness the profit motive. And uh, with networks, um, which is what platforms are generally delivering, the resulting exchange of value is often asymmetric, obscure, and unilateral to, um, to individual users. So what does that mean in, in practice? Well, okay, um, as I said, I'm, 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 I, I have a feeling many of these problems apply also to uh, sort of Google's various platforms. As it happens, Gmail seems to have stayed out of the um, uh, major criticisms recently. But if you think of Facebook as basically being another way of communicating with your friends and strangers, rather like email, but just using lots and lots of different kinds of media content in lots of different ways, then it kind of makes sense that it's a platform that's operating in the same communication space. And basically, Facebook's in trouble. Um, it's being attacked uh, for uh, censoring political views. Uh, on one side. On the other side, it's also um, being attacked for allowing lots of fake news and uh, various damaging things to get through. So basically, it's, it's a classic case where you've got an institutional set of arrangements where it's kind of over-regulated according to some and on one side and under-regulated in, in other ways. Um, on its sort of on the two-sided market, on its other side, uh, with its advertisers, it also sometimes gets into trouble because it has proprietary data. It uh, basically is very hard to credibly signal what exactly it's delivering to advertisers. It's the you know it's its own regulator, its own contract, its own kind of um, uh, surveyor when it's uh, when it's delivering on a contract when advertisers want um, uh, want certain content delivered to certain very specific types of people. Um, Facebook is in a very strong position when it comes to users. It's in also in a very strong position when it comes to advertisers. Um, at the same time, they're a bit loose with data. It's very leaky. It's all held centrally. Um, so if there's a, a, a vulnerability, if someone manages to exploit, get into uh, their servers, they can end up losing a lot of data. Um, and as we know, you know, as of necessity, because it's very important for their successful advertising, that data is extremely personal. Um, and at the same time, people are using Facebook uh, to identify themselves in various other applications. That's a great thing about a gigantic platform, a gigantic credible platform. Um, that means that this, when, when, when that data is lost, it very easily becomes a uh, source of identity threat, theft and various kinds of fraud. Um, so lots of inconveniences that are kind of that, that we already aware of and it just seems to be spiraling into uh, you know kind of scarier and scarier um, uh, uh, kind of thing so uh, Facebook uh, as it happens was trying to move into the, the cryptocurrency space uh, with a kind of currency that I think it intended to control quite heavily so not really decentralized in the way that uh, the people who invented the technology had in mind but still trying to enter the space maybe develop it in some way and uh, Congress is worried that it's going to um, in, in, induce uh, you know, uh, massive uh, financial instability uh, because it's just a gigantic platform that controls an enormous amount of, of, what, um, of, of what people do on the internet now. Um, and now, most recently, it, it seems like um, people are fearful that Facebook presents a kind of uh, various existential threats, both from COVID um, spreading, uh, spreading sort of fake news and fake uh, um, uh, uh, science about, uh, about COVID-19, um, and also sort of um, basically benefiting from, because it kind of gets its kind of clickbait this way, this sort of ginning up um, polarization within the US election. Now, I'm rather skeptical that Facebook can end democracy, but if you can think about a lot of other things that might be kind of pushing at uh, kind of our, our um, democratic institutions right now, it's possible that it's making, at the margin, uh, things a little bit more choppy. I, uh, I, I don't know, I think, I think it's a little bit, a little bit over overemphasized, but I, I think you can see why there's reasons to worry about this, this sort of technological development. And it's all because ultimately um, it has a set of, um, of profit, um, I mean, it, 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 it has certain incentives that um, ensures that it has to focus on the bottom line rather than the potential externalities that it might be generating. Uh, so to summarize, the key problem is that many things with personal data and content sharing that platforms can do, um, should not do, and do not intend to do, we can presume at least, uh, but on the other hand, they sometimes do anyway by accident or negligence, 
uh, also, unfortunately, can make a lot of money if they did it. That's why we get a little bit suspicious about um, the various ways that, this, uh, that, that Facebook and uh, other platforms interact with users and, and platforms. And at the same, same side, because it's so proprietary, it's hard to observe when they're doing it, or rather it's hard to, for them to prove when they're not doing it. So um, we can assume um, uh, faithful agents or sincere agents in this, uh, in this activity, there's, people are still going to develop a problem of credibility because everyone knows that they're everyone, the, the personal incentives or the incentives of the actors kind of go against what um, everyone would ideally like to happen or like to be doing. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, in, in an admission that Facebook almost does fulfill certain governance roles now, um, it's trying to constrain itself a little bit like a gov government. So it's trying to introduce its own Supreme Court, a kind of board that is meant to uh, verify um, what uh, Mark Zuckerberg is doing and take decisions over kind, the kinds of policies, the kind of things that it allows on the platform and the kind of things that it doesn't kind of get a bit of diversity into the decision process. Um, uh, it's hard to know whether, you know, a kind of, whether a Supreme Court within a private company can really be credible because of course, you know, there's nothing really stopping it from being abolished if it, if it fails. Uh, it hasn't got the US Marshals or some equivalent to kind of protect it. Um, but, um, uh, you can see that they're kind of trying to think innovatively about how to solve some of these these um, uh, these problems. Um, now, what can blockchains do in this in this context? Now, uh, on my account, they can reassert and expand the role of protocols. They can uh, also harness uh, the capacity for direct value transfer, uh, i.e., the sort of stuff that Bitcoin is meant to be doing uh, to support developments of decentralized applications. Um, so, let me explain a little bit about how that works. So. Um, let's take what was the common mode of, of engaging in trade, value exchange, or at least we, we presume it is. I mean, obviously, histor history is a little bit murky, but basically, um, uh, the last time that we had a system whereby you could, you could exchange value based on two parties only was when you kind of exchanged precious metals, like um, uh, uh, commonly. So you knew that if you handed over your gold or silver pieces, um, that you were at that point transferring the value there without any third party having to say, yeah, that's happened. It just happens if you're just passing it over, over to someone. Um, Obviously, that was very inconvenient for various ways. And so a combination of states and, um, and private organizations set up notes, which were first a lot easier to kind of hold and to, you know, much more mobile. Adam Smith has got a great passage in The Wealth of Nations on how fantastic it is if you can free uh, a, a kind of transfer system from, uh, from precious metals and you can like, you know, really, really free up uh, a lot of resources. Um, uh, by, by, by exchanging in a kind of more abstract form of value. Um, but of course, uh, you're going to need something uh, to back uh, those notes if you're going to be e exchanging it. Otherwise, it's just paper. Now, I, I've been, a, this, is, this is probably a little bit um, ahistorical because of course, there's plenty of other, you know, there, there was plenty of other organizations that used to um, issue notes, although it's become uh, uh, a part of uh, the, uh, the fiat system. Um, we often don't like to use check, like to use cash. We'd rather use uh, checks because you know we can like set the exact number. There's no there's no annoying change to kind of come around. You can post it. It's a bit more safe to post that kind of thing. You've got various identifying marks on it, um, and there you need a bank to uh, to say that's say that's okay. Um, so you've got your third party in there. Then it has to be a very trusted third party, preferably with a kind of stone facade, so you know it's not going to just disappear overnight. Um, that kind of thing, and of course these days. Um, uh, all banks have to be regulated by states as well. So there's, a, there's another party as well that wants, wants a taste, find, d decide what kind of um, transactions are legitimate. And um, uh, Bitcoin, the dream of Bitcoin is really taking us back to gold um, in the sense that it's got this, uh, this common framework, a network, uh, which no one owns, but anyone can participate in and people get rewarded for, for um, uh, verifying transactions. And that means that Anyone, rather like anyone who says, oh, I accept gold and silver. Now, if you accept Bitcoin, um, then you can make a transfer to anyone else with, uh, with, with, uh, with Bitcoin. And there's no kind of um, uh, required trusted third party, sort of no kind of institution that you're kind of relying on. Oh, sorry, not institution. Bitcoin is an institution, but no organization that you're relying on anymore. Um, and um, although Bitcoin itself has, has rather... Um, uh, has has issues with actually being a, a stable system of um, of uh, of kind of transfer for kind of ordinary transactions. Um, 
uh, with, um, with the Ethereum platform, we're starting to see some things that look a little bit more useful as a kind of uh, for, for everyday transactions. This is um, DAI, um, this is uh, um, USDC, and this is uh, um, Tether, UDT. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of them. Um, uh, and these are, these are stable coins that aim to uh, match the value of, um, of the US dollar. I haven't seen a sterling stable coin yet. That, that might be useful, actually. But, um, uh, and and uh, uh, with the exception of DAI, which uses a kind of very interesting uh, collateralized system, which involves putting a lot of Ethereum in a, in a smart contract, um, uh, these stable coins do rely on some trusted um, third party uh, to operate. Um, but on the other hand, when you're making individual transfers um, uh, with these tokens, you're not actually relying on that on that third party. You can make those uh, directly. So if you, if you want to kind of move out of the system, if you want to get your dollars back um, or trade back into a, um, uh, well, if, if you want to get back into the into the fiat currency system, you, you're, you're at some point, you're going to have to trust some of the various on ramps on the um, uh, in, on the kind of crypto uh, currency scene, um, uh, but for a lot of everyday transactions, um, these things are these are things are very useful. Um, so you can make a direct transfer, um, de denominating something very close to US dollars, um, and you end up and you can make this transfer instantaneously, um, any time of the day or night, um, and a person can. Uh, you, you're, you're, the other party can confirm they've had it usually within minutes. It depends a little bit on, on how fast the Ethereum uh, blockchain is running at the time. Um, and once they've got it, you know, they've got it almost as if it's actual cash, you know, it's in their, it's in their digital wallet. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, so in, in that sense, it's, it's in some ways already faster than trying to conduct a kind of or, ordinary transaction kind of globally. Um, very useful for someone like me who might, um, uh, you know, it's quite hard for me to open a US bank account. It's rather expensive. I mean, I can, but it, but it, there's quite a lot of transaction costs. I can hold um, USDC um, in a wallet, um, and uh, you know, there's just there's just um, uh, there, there's no party that says that there's anything wrong with that. It's just just held on the um, held on held on the blockchain. Um, now, I think what I see is that the fact that we can transfer value now quite quickly across the blockchain. Um, suggests that we, we're quite soon going to find ways of, um, of uh, uh, offering an alternative to various platforms. So just to kind of explain a little bit more what I see the current platform set up is, what you've got is you've got these fantastically well-run systems, uh, but with this sort of issues of credibility and data, data management. Um, running it, you essentially you know, have a CEO and his team. Uh, behind the CEO, you've got uh, their, uh, their shareholders, um, and they're expecting a return, um, if, especially if they put in a lot of money early on, they're hoping to get a big return based on the kind of network effects basically becoming a dominant platform in a certain sector, which is going to allow them to become, uh, you know, to, to, to gain a profit that was worth the initial risk, which is involved in trying to, you know, basically become another, another behemoth in this sector. You know, a lot, a lot of these, a lot of these, um, uh, these firms fail. So, you know, they'll be hoping for a big payoff. And at the same time, because these organizations are kind of, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're corporations, they're, you know, they've got an address, they've got personnel that are involved, uh, that are making decisions, which means that ultimately they can be subject to regulation, they can be subject to um, informal pressure of various kinds. And so ultimately, um, uh, these platforms can also become kind of creatures of the state, they're just too big. Uh, not to become targets for particular state policies. So we're very much reliant on basically um, uh, governments re retaining, remaining constitutionally constrained for these platforms to, to keep behaving. Um, blockchain protocols um, increasingly can, can allow you to get, get behind that by basically saying that uh, basically you can, you can launch a protocol which performs many of the functions that, um, that these platforms can, can do um, but once launched, um, it's just the two parties uh, that get together and transact. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the developers, rather than being owners of a firm, which is sort of running it, um, they uh, basically gain, uh, they'll, they'll sort of award themselves some tokens that are associated with the, uh, with, with, with the platform, uh, so with, with this protocol. And uh, as a result, uh, and if and if the protocol works, the value of those tokens will go up a lot, and that's where they'll take their take their profit. 
um, in return for introducing uh, a new, you know, a new, a, a, a new protocol. So in other words, they can, they, they can put more time and effort, they can develop it, provide many of the kind of um, uh, the elements that you would expect of a platform, but ultimately is released and is available for anyone to, to, um, to, to, to access. Um, so, and there's a few ways in which I think you could, we could imagine this working quite well. Um, you could set up a system where um, uh, people are, are participating on a network, you're collecting data, you know, through your wallet, you know, it's all, it's all very easily uh, accessible. Um, and you could uh, potentially allow users to sell uh, their private de data, um, so cryptographically uh, secured and sort of bundled uh, to advertisers. So that advertisers can access the sort of people that they want to target, but they'll have no way of ever actually being able to de-anonymize them. So it's kind of, it's secured um, in, 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 in that sense. So that they, they know that they're targeting people they want to target, but they have no way of knowing what the individuals are. Hence, less problems with kind of data leaks. Um, Oh, yes. Might I uh, interject just for a clarifying question on the ads in particular? Yeah. So you're saying users of a blockchain and where, where I'm becoming a little confused is you had the Bitcoin logo there. And so mm -hmm. what data would a Bitcoin user be selling? Um, it, 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 or are you thinking of a more sort of robust blockchain platform where more, much more user identity is contained in the, in the underlying transactions of the platform? I guess I'm struggling to see an ad developer that's like, I really want to target Bitcoin blockchain users other than maybe, yeah, maybe some crypto firms that, you know, want to be able to target, you know, crypto users re really well. But beyond that, are you envisioning a kind of more robust data set that the ad, ad companies would be interested? Yes, yes. No, you're, you're quite right, Eric. In fact, the, 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 the B is, is, is confusing. I'm using B as a kind of, as a, as a sort of a signature for profit there. Uh, I'm assuming oh, gotcha, that the gotcha, entrepreneurs yeah. are trying to, will, will cash out into something they see as solid, which might well be Bitcoin, but actually could be, um, could be USDC, could be um, uh, Ethereum, could be anything, uh, uh, actually. So yeah, I think that's, that's yeah, no, you know, you're quite right that in terms of the granularity of the data that people would be looking for, um, the Bitcoin network is not, is not going to deliver it. It's going to be some of the, um, uh, the, the platforms that will be delivering um, various other kinds of services. That will be the kind of way to do it. In fact, that kind of leads on a little bit to, to what to what we're doing. I, I kind of, um, uh, just to kind of illustrate, this isn't just purely about private sector um, uh, uses. Um, uh, the, uh, this um, is, is only becoming more, um, uh, more of an issue as we kind of uh, deal with the kind of lingering pandemic. Um, but um, uh, there's a lot of data in health systems which uh, naturally are, are, um, uh, are often very private. Uh, people uh, have reasons for, for holding on to their data. Um, they don't want to share the illnesses or you know, various conditions that they've had or the, you know, the, the schedule in which they've gone to see doctors, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, on the other hand, that data is very, very useful for developing uh, treatments if we, if we possibly can, you know, if we get hold of that. Um, there's a lot that uh, research scientists can do. There's a lot that pharmaceutical companies can do. Um, and at the same time, it's nice if private firms, pharmacists, most pharmacists in the UK are, are, are private firms of some sort. It's nice if they can communicate directly um, with, uh, you know, with health systems. Um, but on the other hand, the data in order to know that someone needs to pick up a prescription can be quite limited. It doesn't actually need to be, you just need to know enough to know that this person is picking it up, they're a legitimate person to pick it up, and this is the right medicine for them. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense for data to be spread, you know, in a kind of fashion in which unfortunately it is on, on a lot of public databases in this kind of insecure fashion where it's kind of very easy for it to leak, leak off. Um, it, I, I, I anticipate um, th some of these, these blockchains basically allowing people to be much more confident that their health records can be secured, not necessarily by them alone, um, but only, but, but to the extent that they can be very confident that either someone is accessing their record um, because they want them to, like right now, if they can give permission, or they'll be aware of precisely who has, because one of the advantages of a, of a blockchain, it's very easy to kind of set up a record of who has accessed, who's changed, who's kind of made alterations to a record. So it kind of is a great way of, of delivering accountability. And if you kind of like take, the take a kind of database as a whole, cryptographically secured, then you can like interrogate it for particular items of data, which can then, you know, kind of, you know, be, be useful for kind of big, big data analysis. So I see a lot of prospects there. 
Um, in terms of things that are actually happening, there's, um, there's, a, there's quite a few um, interesting um, um, projects that are moving into the space. Um, and uh, because there's a lot of comp competition and rivalry, I didn't want to like single out any particular name on, on this kind of thing. But um, th there are some uh, various attempts to provide user incentivized advertisements. So um, uh, Eric, as to your question, that was kind of what I had in mind that you'd have a system that rewarded people for um, going to certain websites that are linked to this, um, uh, uh, linked to an advertising network, rather like Google ads today, or or or, um, or indeed Facebook ads that you often see in various in very on various other um, uh, websites, um, and um, uh, users uh, can basically be rewarded for uh, for viewing ads, or rather, you know, being willing to have ads appear on on the sites that they're that they're doing uh, in return for you know for for sharing their their cryptographically um, uh, secured data um, uh, and that means that ultimately you're getting paid for reading the news which is which is nice um, so you kind of get a share of, of what um, uh, of, of what previously these major advertising platforms were, were taking and making these 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 excessive profits from um, very big at the moment is um, uh, decentralized finance um, which now provides various forms of non-custodial token exchange collateralized lending insurance and various options where you can kind of bet on the prices of various things um the only thing about that is it's kind of a bit insider at the moment it's basically something for for like what other uh, members of the of the kind of of of, of the kind of blockchain um world are, are kind of interested in it's kind of this this weird case where a lot of the stuff which would be the last thing to be developed in another sector becomes the first thing to, to be developed in this kind of sector. Um, but nevertheless, very, very interesting. You can kind of get, very, you can disappear into this stuff very, very easily if you kind of look at, um, look at kind of um, uh, coin telegraph news. There's kind of new forms of, um, of uh, finance constantly coming on stream. Um, VPN services, that's something that, that can work. You can, you, can, you can purchase a token which allows you to set up a, um, uh, a VPN um, where you um uh where 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 the, where the vpn is provided by by other parties uh, rather than a kind of sent rather than organized by a central um a central node so you know potentially more secure for now not particularly more secure compared to um compared to a professional vpn but could get there um video streaming file storage um content ownership and exchange via non-fungible tokens uh, that kind of basically uh will eventually be a way of of uh, doing something like um uh, Napster, so Spotify, that's what it is these days. Um, uh, and uh, that's very exciting from a governance perspective, uh, third party mediation. Um, so there, there are some uh, applications that are, that are meant to be allowing um, uh, basically you to set up a kind of anonymous third party that can judge a problem at the moment a, a problem that or a dispute that's emerged in the blockchain space and you can have a ruling and that ruling can be codified in a smart contract so you can kind of pre-commit to be bound by that third party if decides if um if a, if a dispute has come up um and i think an important feature of this is that i imagine this is like a bold pr prediction on my part uh, my part is that the is that the more common protocols for any given resource or service exchange become the easier it will become to establish a new autonomous protocol for something else and i think that um the the existence of stable coins is like one way in which these things are going to become easier because you know you no longer have to deal with you know kind of highly volatile tokens when interacting with these services in other words if you can crack the the decentralized currency exchange then um, and trade, then suddenly lots of other things um, that require resources of various kinds can be can be paid for, um, and they and they can increasingly be um, paid for you automatically using um, you know using smart contracts. So there's, there's there's increasingly less reliance on some kind of um, trusted third party to kind of to kind of manage these things. Um, now, the current challenges. Um, it's not all rosy. Uh, I think there are, there are key challenges that kind of set up my, my kind of my narrow corridor. First is excessive short term profit. Tokens have extremely volatile sentiment driven value. Developers can get too rich too quick. As a result, they lose the marginal incentive to develop the protocol, which they may have been, you know, they released to much funfair just a, um, you know, maybe just, just, just a few weeks ago or a few months ago. Um, 
sometimes people will come back to it after they become extremely rich, but they tend to kind of, you know, um, what, once they've kind of secured themselves, they haven't quite got the same fire that they may have had um, when they were literally just coders in a basement and that now they're, they've become millionaires overnight. Um, and of course that means uh, this is like open season for speculators and fraudsters uh, to engage in things like pump and dump strategies. So there's a lot of kind of bubbly stuff that's kind of going on. And then the other problem is, is actually the opposite problem. We have low, maybe zero long-term profit uh, when you're delivering common protocols. And the reason is that common protocols are open to public inspection. It's very easy to fork someone else's project. Um, you know, you just inspect it, copy it, repackage it, offer something, um, uh, 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 offer a, a slight variation on it. Um, and, um, uh, and also, uh, because these these tokens that are issued that are associated with these projects are, ex are now very easily exchanged on multiple um, uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, it's actually very easy to steal uh, users. Um, so it's very easy to kind of move. You know, there's there's, there's no um, you know there's, there's no kind of brand. Um, uh, uh, it, it was very hard to develop kind of brand um, credibility in this sector because it's very easy to kind of to, to basically siphon off people. Um, uh, and the key thing is that any successful project that reserves N value in tokens for developers can be defeated by a clone um, offering N minus one value to developers, and that tends to zero. Um, uh, so basically the competitive advantage of these protocols does not actually create a moat uh, that, 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 that is very easily defended. It's just, it's very easy. If, if someone can develop a credible clone, then it will be developed and then it, then it becomes a, you know, kind of very dangerous space. Um, so I think this is, this is what, what I see being the big challenge in the space right now. Um, you basically need to, to navigate these, these two problems. So, you know, obviously if you get zero profit and you end up with a lot of um, applications, that's fantastic for, for users, but they're gonna go undeveloped. Um, at least if we assume that most of the people working in the space, um, well, they need to eat at least. Um, and many of them probably want to uh, earn a lot more than that because it's a highly specialized work that they could be applying to the financial sector or to uh, IT systems in general. They probably need some reason to kind of do it. On the other hand, um, it's very easy even for legitimate developers to benefit too quickly um, to, uh, and because of the nature of decentralized exchanges, very easy to cash out of the project that they're working in. Um, and so they don't end up on the path to, um, to the, kind of the, the kind of ecosystem that I'm looking forward to either. So there's this kind of like uh, this, this, this space that we need to navigate where, um, and it's very easy to fall into one or the other of these, of these paths. Um, now there are some emerging solutions, which is why I think the sector is still working. Um, in, in order to avoid the short-term profit trap, um, I think there's a great deal of intrinsic motivation that's kind of going into the sector. So people want to make money, but they also want to um, do something like destroy the financial system, you know, because they hate um, the existing banking system, that kind of thing. Um, there's personal reputation. So whether someone has developed an anonymous identity or, a, um, or they're known for their real identity as some of the kind of uh, major players are, they... Um, uh, uh, they may want to carry on, they may want their project to succeed um, even after they've kind of made, um, uh, you know, made, made money on the project. Um, you know, they, they, you know so, so rather like the kind of billionaires in Sil Silicon Valley competing uh, to succeed in the next project, they're kind of um, still engaged in, um, uh, uh, still engaged in developing the sector. Um, and, and also th there are some institutional mechanisms that develop. So um, you, you, now with, uh, with the sort of smart, smart contracts now being um, getting quite sophisticated, a, um, a, a blockchain entrepreneur or developer can now award themselves locked tokens in their own, in their own protocol. Um, and they can kind of say, oh, well, I, I can only take it out so much at a time, or it's kind of locked for like six months, or it's locked for a couple of years. That's enough time to develop the protocol. Other people can buy into it, of course. There's, there's an open exchange um, uh, 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 on it. But really, I, I, um, I'm only really going to take my profit, um, the, the amount that I've reserved for myself, the enormous amounts I've res reserved for myself, if the token is valuable at X time or continues to be valuable over a certain uh, time period. Um, so that's kind of one way in which you can kind of force yourself, the, the, uh, the entrepreneur can kind of force themselves uh, onto that narrow corridor. Um, 
Just wanted to interject very briefly. You may not have seen, but I uh, hit you in the chat five minutes ago saying you had roughly five minutes remaining. So oh, you're, you're we're at the, okay. You're technically cutting into your Q&A. This is fascinating, but I also wanted to give you the, the prerogative to the continue. The chance, yeah. Okay, that's, that's good, because we're not, we're not too far off. Um, okay. So let's, yeah, let's, let's get to the end, and, um, and then, I'll, and then uh, yeah, I understand that we're, 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 in, we're, we're in the Q&A a little bit, but fi five minutes, um, well, zero minutes now. Okay, zero long-term profit uh, solutions. Once again, intrinsic motivation. You might not care that you're not going to make an enormous amount of money in the future, or if you just make a little bit along the way. Um, irrational exuberance play, I think, goes a long way. I think a lot of people think, well, maybe they haven't realized that there's zero long-term profits in most common goods, um, but uh, they, may, uh, so they may not have realized it yet, or if they have, they may think, well, it's okay, I'll know when to cash out. So there's, there's the kind of, um, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's extra economic um, or other irrational biases helping us along the way in this case. Um, and I think what's very interesting is transition, um, what's very popular now is a transition to user democracy with governance tokens. I'm going to give an example of that in a second. And um, uh, one thing that hasn't been talked about quite so much, and I can talk about a bit more in the Q&A, is the possibility of bundling private goods, or rather putting yourself in a position to provide private goods um, uh, by providing the, the kind of common protocol. If you think about the way that Linux developed, very much a, a lot of that was you know, offering a common system, but by that stage, you're a specialist who can make a lot of money by, um, uh, by, helping, by helping people use the system in various ways. Um, and um, uh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, there's some reason for optimism because unlike state development, competition between rival projects without geographic limitations should allow for evolutionary selection of projects along this sort of narrow corridor. Um, so just, just to end on this sort of case study, um, uh, illustrates a lot of the, the, um, the problems and solutions that, um, uh, that, um, uh, that, that I've been talking about just now. Um, so Uniswap, is the largest decentralized token exchange um, at the moment. It is secured on the Ethereum blockchain. It rewards suppliers of token liquidity with exchange fees. Great system, very, very popular. Um, but we've got the N minus one problem. Sushi Swap is a self-described community-friendly fork of Uniswap, so it just copies the code. Issues liquidity providers with a governance token in addition to fees. And that represents a claim on futures fees. And those tokens are also exchangeable. Um, so what happened um, in the last three weeks, in fact, Sushi's value rose more than a thousand percent in three days. That, that happens quite a bit in the blockchain space. It's not that surprising. 10 days after release, Sushi, Sushi Swap's anonymous founder cashed out their controlling stake using Uniswap, the competitor, and stopped developing the project. After a community outcry, reputation, intrinsic motivation, something like that coming in. The founder returned the funds and endorsed new leadership, which was partly elected. Although of course, because it's very easy to have anonymous accounts of these things, it's, I imagine he probably didn't, I mean, it's, it's hard to prove that he, he, he um, that was the only way that he profited from uh, the, the system. New leadership recovered the project to initiate a vampire attack to draw liquidity from Uniswap and uh, I think Uniswap was already planning on doing this, but um, uh, around this time, Uniswap decided to issue its own governance token. So in other words, kind of doing an N run around this N minus one problem. It does an N minus two kind of approach, offers the opportunity of community governance um, itself. And um, although, you know, sort of um, Uniswap sort of took a hit during this, this um, vampire attack, it's now actually fully recovered thanks to uh, uh, this, this, um, uh, this new um, token. Um, and as and sushi swaps doing okay, not as well as it was during during its uh, you know kind of when it was making this, almost this hostile takeover, um, and um, uh, but it's not it's not as big as um, uh, as 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 Uniswap. Um, so you know just just to conclude, um, platform challenges they have lots of power, fearful users and contractors and governments that are increasingly trying to regulate them. Blockchains add a much greater role for common protocols. Um, there's a narrow corridor, excess short-term profit and long-term zero profit. I have some reasons for optimism because if the corridor exists at all, then I think this evolutionary ecological system that we're in should find it. Um, and I've, I've offered you some decentralized, some case studies, um, uh, which um, uh, I think um, uh, look, look very promising. And um, 
just, just uh, you know, as a final thought, just to explain where I'm coming from, um, we've got um, uh, really my thinking about this is informed by James Buchanan's constitutional robot, um, which at the time was was this idea, a completely theoretical idea, impossible to imagine. Um, uh, but Buchanan was saying, ideally, we wouldn't want um, we, we, we wouldn't want people to enforce state laws at all. If we could have an impersonal mechanism that just enforced the, the same laws every time, and we could agree that and contractually be bound by that, that would be the way that we could truly engage in self governance. And that I, I, I see with this. Um, uh, sector kind of offering. So um, uh, apologies for cutting into the Q&A, um, uh, but I hope I've given some uh, food, food for thought. Um, uh, this paper is kind of an inspiration for this, for this presentation. Uh, so there's, there's some overlap, but there's, there was also quite a lot of new stuff. But I, I'd um, uh, rec recommend taking a look at that, particularly to understand the link between this, this, the way I'm thinking here, and Buchanan and, uh, and F.A. Hayek. Um, so uh, thank you again, Eric, and um, uh, I can be here all night if necessary. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. No, that was, that was excellent. I'm going to waive my moderator's prerogative for the moment in terms of I do have questions for you, and I will have them at uh, whenever the audience questions conclude. But does anyone have any questions? Either uh, raise your hand or throw, uh, throw, your name in the, throw a sign in the chat box that, hey, I've got a question. I've got a question. Go ahead. I, for some reason, my video is not coming on. It's uh, a great photo, though. Thank you. I wonder if you could say more about what uh, is the public good that people are competing to, com to provide? I'm a little puzzled by that phrase. Oh, yeah. No, I, OK. Now I see what you Maybe I'm being a little bit um, uh, too. Um, ambitious in the sense that uh, I suppose it's mostly common goods and oh you're, 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 you're here now Lawrence it's, the videos the videos up um, it's mostly common goods and network goods that I'm kind of thinking about here I mean if we think about um, market transaction or the ability to engage in mar market transactions um, themselves as a public good as, as uh, Buchanan um, uh, claimed in, a, in, in, in several places. And I, then I think that um, ultimately these things are reaching towards providing a, a kind of uh, public good because they're offering a, a, a way in which people can engage in really open access, secure transactions. Um, so they're providing the kind of, they're, they're providing the marketplace in so which people can-, can preventing can theft, that sort of thing? Um, yes, yes, yeah. I have another question. Uh, okay, no, I thought that there was going to be a, a rebuttal there or something like that. Okay, um, so I'm I'm just going to ask about a stereotype and like just put it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if your expectations um, are realistic vis-a-vis -vis the type of people that are actually sufficiently interested in blockchain technologies as to put all the time that it will be needed to develop these kind of solutions. Because the stereotype is that in general, if you go to blockchain, what you want is money, fast money. And this is the good stereotype. Mm. The bad stereotype is even worse, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's... Um... That's right. No, I think there are a lot of people who are kind of in it because um, they want to make money very quickly. Um, and it's very quite likely that they're going to lose a lot of money as a, as a result. So rather like um, the dot com bubble, um, there's uh, there's a lot of ways to lose money in this in this system. Um, in fact, um, one thing that I've noticed about the way that the sector, the sector operates, um, and you, you'll notice this by the way that the, if you look at the, um, if you look at any project website, um, you, you'll find that um, they rely an awful lot on branding. Um, so normally associations with major players in the sector um, or companies 
uh, that are that are in fact are regulated and in fact are kind of well known at this stage well known to kind of financial authorities and um, and very you know and are kind of like um, willing to be regulated in various ways um, it, in order to kind of assure people that they're a kind of serious project so really at this stage it's actually very it's almost very old-fashioned business that's kind of developing that's kind of developing the sector it's not kind of anonymous or rather developing the real sector it's not kind of anonymous um uh cyber um uh you know hackers it's um it's kind of people um who who are willing to kind of put their name um and you know use their reputation to kind of get to, to kind of get initial cooperation off off the ground and uh, and there are some professional auditors who kind of also rely on their reputation to um to basically inspect code and say yes this is a genuine smart contract um there's no way in which your funds can be removed at least not not that we can find we estimate the following kinds of contract risk so that they, they, they kind of have a um a notion that it's like well it's code there could be bugs in it that means that ultimately you know you you, you know you're, you're at risk and because it's a common protocol it's it could all be lost it could all uh, collapse um and it has happened um, on a number of occasions as well. So you know, there, there's there's reasons to be very careful about participating in the in the in, in, in the sphere. Um, but I, I think that you know we've kind of been here before, where you kind of have weird nerds who think that there's something very big about to happen, and uh, you know often they're wrong on the timing, or sometimes they're completely wrong. In the case of something like fusion. Um, just never never quite happens or is always happening about 50 years from now um, but you know I, I imagine if you if you go back to the railways or you go back to the inventors in the 19th century a lot of them would kind of probably fit the same kind of obsessional kind of weird um, kind of character traits that you just that, that you kind of you'd find in this sector today um, so you know they could be wrong it might turn out that the way that the way that humans and computers interact cannot involve this level of kind of of common protocol cooperation firms have some unique way some some completely um some something you cannot replace firms and states maybe um that that these things cannot replace in which case you know my my narrow corridor thesis is becomes it's actually a it's a closed door like it, it will develop in a way that that people will think is coming into something and then it will eventually turn out that actually it's not going to it's not going to um, work. Cool. That's always a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Lots of thinking there. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a few burning questions. Uh, Larry, again, please. Yeah. I mean, this leads into the question of whether uh, stable coins. Uh, will be allowed to continue playing the role they play, which mm -hmm. is to give access to payments to people for whom a U.S. dollar denominated bank account is blocked. And it's blocked for a reason that has to do with know your customer rules and paranoia about money laundering, which as we've learned this week is actually mm -hmm. taking place within the banking system. <laughs> yes. Not outside, but nonetheless, how much longer will, uh, how big will uh, stable coins be allowed to grow before the John Law comes down on them? Yeah, no, that's that's a good that's a good question. Um, I, I uh, yeah, I, I suppose um, it, if we assume some level of um, of um, uh, com competitive jurisdictions at the state level. Then it might be possible that um, if you know if this if this thing becomes popular enough that um, uh, some other countries, perhaps something like Switzerland, you know, that would be a kind of a classic kind of um, re regime that would that would be quite good at doing this, would be willing to host stable coins. And I, I, I'm not sure how easy it would be for the U.S. government to block, you know, obviously people want to transact in something denominated in US dollar. I mean, Swiss the US bank, government yeah. shut down numbered Swiss bank accounts. Um, so, okay, so the question would be, where would the on-ramp be if you're trying to get, if you're, if you're in a US system, 
if you're in the if if you're in the United States and you want to get access to this to this system, um, and they've banned U.S. denominated stable coins, um, so you shut down U.S. bank accounts. I I still think that foreigners will be able to do it, but it's true that that people actually in in a, in 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 the United States may um uh may may struggle. I mean they may have to make use of um. For example, a um, a cryptographically secured VPN in order to access their funds, um, which I suppose would be illegal. But at least it would be illegal only for the user. So, in other words, the, the 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 there might be protocols which will basically say, well, you know, normally it's easier to go after the firms. In this case, you would only be going after um, you would you'd have to be going after individual users, which normally is is less popular. Not saying it can't happen, uh, but less popular. I mean, I mean, the other thing is that. Um, so, um, Dai, for example, um, doesn't actually have any custodial system whatsoever. Um, so it, it's backed by, uh, Ethereum, by, um, Ether that people have kind of, uh, put in. So it kind of, it's, it's issued on the, on, on the basis of a, of a, of actually a very volatile, but for now quite valuable coin. So people are prepared to trust it. Um, and that kind of, um, Means that there's that's sort of another way in which there isn't really a connection with the um, with the U.S. banking system. So it it could be the case that you you could transact in something denominated in in U.S. U.S. dollars, but if you're prepared, if enough people are willing to use that, you never actually have to touch U.S. dollars again. You just use this thing which is which is pegged in some way in a closed system, which um, doesn't. Um, which doesn't need to come into contact with the banking system. So, um, you know, now, of course, there are strategies in which you could try and force people not to use Ethereum wallets, um, but then you'd be getting into very, you know, kind of, you, you'd be engaging in a lot of, of surveillance and a lot of kind of, um, you'd have to be taking much, much more control over people's internet services if you were, if you were to do that. So I think it's, it's really at the on-ramp, it's really the connections between the blockchain sector and the mainstream financial sector where currently governments have the That's most right. power to influence right. what's going on. And insofar as you can resist the need to engage with that, they're, they're, it, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, it's going to be awkward, very awkward. It would be a very different kind of regime that can actually, that can actually, uh, uh, that can actually stop that from happening. Sorry, I'm rambling at this point. Let's, let's bring some other people in. I see some significant issues with the off ramp too. Um, so I acquire a variety of stable coin through a cryptographically secure VPN and I'm in the United States with an administration that's observably hostile towards stable coins. Where am I going to spend them? Presumably they aren't going to be permitting very many uh, domestically domiciled merchants to accept the form of payment that they've exhibited this level of hostility towards. And so I do think that there are off-ramp considerations and granted you might wash it through an exchange but if they can observe your bank account and you're getting deposits from an exchange above a certain level i think those might trigger certain types of regulatory questions as well um but maybe i'm missing something i, I welcome your thoughts on this nick yeah no i mean if, if they if they sort of banned the use of um stable coins yeah, no, you would you would basically be uh, you'd have to buy services from people anonymously. So maybe other people in the United States, but you know you can't know who who they are, and they can't know who you are. So that would be like uh, that would be like one area in which is so you you'd you'd kind of be buying in. It would be basically buying internet services um, from uh, 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 from the system, and it would be it would be relatively hard for for the system to. Um, to in for for the U.S. government to intercept that, but no, I, I think you, you're you're right. Ultimately, they can decide what kind of um, exchange is um, is legal in the United States. And I suppose you know, thanks to that uh, very broadly defined commerce clause these days, the the U.S. government could decide. Um, you know, um, uh, I mean, I suppose if you think about it, like I suppose they can ban transactions in Canadian dollars if they so want to. So the same way. They ultimately they could do that. And yeah. I envision a potentially softer approach, which is the IRS states that companies 
doing business in these currencies are of special interest to them. And so mm -hmm. that they would be highly likely to receive additional unwelcome regulatory scrutiny if they happen to still engage in their choice to do business in that particular currency. And so they might, they don't have to go the hard ban to get a lot of the outcomes they want. And, and, and mm -hmm. it, it, this is all speculative, but I've, I've, we, I had an interesting discussion with my students in my blockchain and cryptocurrencies course, which is what would be the ways they could either deter the use of these without right banning them or just go and drop the ban hammer. Um, it's certainly an interesting question. Yeah, and, and here I think the pressure would come from effective protocols that start to replace what we'd normally expect companies and firms to do. So, you know, if you imagine kind of a future where um, video streaming is supplied autonomously through a protocol um, by computers that are linked up anonymously uh, to the network supplying that service, um, rather than using Spotify, you know, a company, you know, with, a, with an office in Silicon Valley, I presume, instead, all your music is secured. Um, so the owner, the artist, or someone that the artist has sold the rights to or, or leased the rights to, um, are secured on the blockchain. So rather than, you know, uh, having to rent um, a you know, paying a subscription service to Spotify, you kind of do a microtransaction, a kind of fraction of a, of a cent or something for every play that you do. Or, or there might still be a subscription system. I'm not sure what people might, might like. And all of that, including the rewards sent out to artists and the people that are supplying the, um, the networks, to allowing you to access something instantly, all of that is provided by a protocol. Um, and you're on it as well. So your services are providing, you know, like, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, you're, you're a podcaster or something and people like to listen in um, on, on what you're, um, what are, 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 you know, to listen to your thoughts. And you're on that network as well. Then in a sense, what you're doing is an enormous amount of the, of your transactions are happening purely autonomously. So it's kind of, so, you know, the IRS, there's nothing, there's nothing for the IRS to, to audit. I mean, apart from you, you know, the podcaster, um, you know, um, so it's, it's kind of, um, yeah. And, and I think given, given the size of that economy, it would kind of be, I, I, I have a feeling that, that um, states would probably imagine that they're probably better off legalizing it and taxing it. Um, you know, as, as income, you know, as, as individual income or whatever firms, you know, I mean, if, if it's legal, then firms can be involved in it fine. I, I, I think that the, the, they'd probably imagine it was in their, in, in their interests. Um, but if they're very scared, you know, if they read my other paper um, and they think, that, that they think that this system is actually going to uh, eventually replace governments altogether, then, then they might be quite right to, to, to come down like a, like a hammer and, and try and stop this stuff from even getting off the ground. That, uh, that reminds me of my summer in May 2 or beginning in May 2001 when I lived in Havana shortly after the government legalized the euro and the dollar as convertible in the Cuban economy because mm -hmm. over half of the transactions in the economy were occurring in the black market were not subject to any type of oversight authority and certainly were not mm -hmm. taxable. And so to me, though, there's an interesting horse race, which is small, small, but big enough to be dangerous, but small enough to still quash versus getting past that line where it's like, no, this is actually of sufficient economic value that the tax revenues to us uh, exceed or, or maybe we can't even quash it. So we're going to get a second best and call it legal and tax it. Um, mm. it, it, it so Certainly, there's, there's precedent globally, especially in countries that have legalized another currency for convertibility, like Cuba, in the face of just the volume of transactions occurring in the economy. Yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. I, I think that, you know, if some of this stuff works well, then um, we might imagine that the status quo now is, in fact, a socialist economy, by comparison. Um, <laughs> So when, when, they, when, when, the, when that exchangeability, it's, it's, it's interesting that you mention it because I, I visited Cuba on, a, on um, a couple of occasions as well. And it was, it was fascinating the way that um, certain goods 
were extremely sought after, you know, and, you know, you kind of wish you'd known, like, like, you, you know, like, and also because it's hard to find out exactly what's short in the, in the economy, you know, um, uh, at the time, because there's, there's so many, so much limited communication, but when you're there, it's, it's fascinating how things are kind of upside down. Um, I, I thought it was kind of, it, it's actually very similar. I mean, it's kind of fascinating how the opposite case to some of the stuff you find in Britain, um, it, 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 it is the case. So, for example, in Cuba, I understand there are a lot of dentists, but there's very little toothpaste. It's very expensive to kind of get, get that in. Whereas in the UK, plenty of toothpaste, very hard to get a dentist. Um, so I think you can think of that as a, as a classic, um, uh, I think that's the, um, uh, the Baumol's cost disease, I suppose. It's kind of in operation, in, in addition to shortages. But you kind of see like, you know, finished goods, very, very hard to get hold of in Cuba, but actually quite a lot of highly skilled people who are kind of at a bit of a loose end and would be quite happy to book you an appointment. Whereas in the UK, awash with goods, very hard to get hold of, um, of specialized, um, some specialized services. Um, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it might well look like that if, you know, we're, the, the kind of Cuba, the Cuba liberalization, although as we've seen, it's kind of stalled. So it's, it's only part of the, part of the message for, for, for liberation. No, I like that. Does anyone else have a question? I've got a, I've got a bit of a pivot question myself, um, kind of bigger picture. So I don't want to, I don't want to lose the thread of the conversation we're having, but if, if no one else has one, so mine surrounds what I kind of see, it's not necessarily the double-edged sword of decentralization, but as applied to certain types of economic transactions, I see this to be the negative edge of the sword, which is transactional finality. And so a perfectly disintermediated system of exchanges between individuals is very final. And this is, this is me just kind of cribbing from Satoshi's white paper. You know, and saying, how can we create digital tokens whose exchange is truly final and irreversible? Mm. Setting aside the irony that the system he was describing actually involves the cash users subsidizing the people using credit cards because of the single price that most people face in, in most retail establishments. It, it, to me, does make a deep underlying point, which is finality is desirable in mm. certain transactional contexts but not all. There are plenty where your level of trust might be higher knowing you have a trusted third party intermediary. And so you, you mentioned a number of promising use cases for the decentralized intermediation by, you know, a, a network where there is no single th third party mm. arbitrator, mediator, reversible agent, you name it. And so a little bit more thought on which context do you think this type of finality is truly desirable or most tractable to application. Um, so most, so where, where, which applications would it most um, be helpful? Um, I mean, I, I suppose the, I, I suppose one example would, pro well, I, I suppose it would be almost anything where you kind of have a stream of, service that you're kind of asking for so it's sort of if it stops working you've got like a, a set of final transactions that are going in that direction you just stop them then um so if, if you're if you're using a streaming service or something um then you know stops working doesn't matter so it's like it's a, a kind of stream of, of kind of small um but final transactions um that that um would strike me as as helpful and the advantage of it is that you don't have to know who you're dealing with, or rather you're dealing with a network that is supplying the resource, maybe file storage or something. Um, and um, uh, so there's, you know, you, you, you don't, it's not even a matter of having a trusted third party or a trusted second party. There's just, there's almost no other party. It's, it's, the, it's the economy itself that you're kind of dealing with. So that's the, um, I, I think that would be an example where, where finality is, is helpful um, in fact, I think it's almost necessary for kind of getting it off the ground in a sense, because it's sort of like, um, it's, it's like, I don't know, it, it would be like, otherwise it would be like trying to set up a service without electricity, almost. It's like, you just need that stream of value that, that is kind of immediately tappable in order to kind of go like, yeah, I, I can hand over my, um, well, actually you could be handing over your electricity in time, um, you know, if, if you have a, a sufficiently smart grid, but in the meantime, it will be like computing resources of some sort. And you just need to know that, yeah, no, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing my resources here. I just need to know that there's 
that there's there's a payment that's that's just final that's coming so i imagine in cases like that and then i think that you're right in general there'll probably be more of a mixed case that's kind of gonna gonna go on and i think that's where um anonymous third party mediation might come in helpful so you might have systems that are kind of set up that reward um uh participants for uh being fair judges uh or jurors in a um uh in in in, in a system um that uh, that allow for um you know for when disputes emerge over for example whether a particular asset is is actually theirs you know that 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 might be able to allow for um uh for for a kind of more mixed uh position where it's like things are presumptively yours uh, but they're held in a smart contract, not directly in your wallet, which is like absolutely um, assailable. And people can, um, uh, and it might be a condition, for example, for you to make use of that asset in some sort, um, that it be in that smart contract, which allows people to um, dispute it. Um, so there's a few, um, there's a few ways in which, in which I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the system could, could start including um, uh, various forms of, um, of, uh, of so I suppose credibility enhancing mechanisms and with it without the without the finality without quite that kind of that that kind of final um, uh, moment in there it's it's kind of conceptually very hard to um, uh, to get your head around it's like one of those other cases it's one of my inception moments when I saw some people in the thing trying to set up a a court system I was like no 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 that 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 can't work and I'm still not entirely convinced but I think that if it if if it does get off the ground then that would be the case where where you can have almost final like a property right basically but but disputable suable in a, in in a certain context no it makes good sense to me I mean it, it... I see political institutions emerging in a variety of contexts. One I just got an email for a few days ago was a release of a certain amount of tokens held by Plutus called Plutons um, for a liquidity injection into their ongoing project that's pretty impressively well backed. So, you know, not just a, not as, as far as I can tell, not just a flash in the point pan mm. crap coin. I won't use obscenity on another university's uh, seminar, but it, 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 you get my drift. And so they had actually, you know, a, a huge level of actual participation in the vote by token holders regarding a decision that became necessary after the network was launched. And so this kind of confronting changes or confronting new contingencies is to me a quintessential governance question that isn't going to go away for these communities. And so mm -hmm. I'm in the camp that thinks provided there's sufficient complexity of transactional processes, sufficiently oppositional interests in a given community, the emergence mm -hmm. of some types of adjudication mechanisms strike me as almost inevitable because of their ubiquity in human social ordering in the real world, so to speak. And so it, 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 I'm definitely on board with, with it. I'm in the camp that believes these networks and especially their transparency and especially the level of engagement that uh, certain networks display vis-a-vis -vis their actual participants, mm. all to me cut towards potentially better methods of intermediation, even though they're not in line with the holy grail of perfect decentralization. It, 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 yeah, just my two cents in response to you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, decentralization at the margin is kind of what what uh, I'm interested in. So I think I'm 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 with you there. And I think uh, on that front, I mean, so it's not just um, these sort of uh, mediation things that are that are developing. I mean, we're also seeing the development of the well, the concept of the protocol politician, um, who will um, essentially, I, I, I think the idea is that is that you know you, you end up with some governance tokens as a user you don't really have any idea what you're doing you're basically like a voter in a in a, in a vast uh, system um, so right so many of them are not voting right now um, also their, their individual votes cannot make a make a difference but um, a protocol politician you might be able to store your um, tokens in their smart contract that will give them your voting power so it won't be it won't be like one politician one vote like in the Senate or Congress or something. It will be like more like um, a big shareholder meeting, I guess. Um, but like um, 
uh, people will specialize in going like, yep, yeah, you know, this is like my strategy. This is what I think is in you, the user's interest, you know, like making an appeal to the users in general. Um, and uh, th I, will, I will fight for your interests on that, on that protocol. Um, so I think, I think that's developing as, a, um, as, a, as, a, as one of the solutions to this kind of narrow corridor that's going on. So, you know, and, and of course there is an anti-politics that's kind of at the heart, you know, Satoshi and, you know, the sort of libertarians who are interested in this sector, they're always trying to escape politics. But of course, you know, if you kind of look at this from a constitutional political economy perspective, you realize that you can't escape politics or rather if you can, you only ever do it at the margin. It always comes back. Um, you're going to have governance specialists um, who will be able to handle this stuff, you know, better than, well, you know, you, 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 you don't have the time and resources to dedicate to figure out where your interests lie in the multitude of decisions that are going to be taken in the system. So inevitably, some people are going to specialize. The, the only thing is that, um, you know, the vote is very easily retracted if it turns out they're, they're going off, off piste. And the, the value is going to be much more in terms of the, as was the weight that people are prepared to put on a, um, to, to, to these sort of protocol uh, specialists. So yeah, no, it's not anti-politics. It's, it's a different kind of politics that we're going to be, be, um, be dealing with. So a final thought regarding the, the narrow corridor analogy is you noted how it, 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 you're, you're drawing the analogy from Asimovu, Johnson and Robinson to the context of uh, it, it decentralized blockchain governance and the innovation that might emerge in that ecosystem requires incentives for new entrepreneurs or new entrants, at least mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Yeah. So my question surrounds what I kind of think of as the heavy hand of the first mover problem. And so some people say Bitcoin is the king of cryptos because mm -hmm. it's so well designed. And there are aspects of its design that are quite impressive. And there are, a heavy, there are a good number of critiques of it, but I get that. It's a reasonably good institutional design, especially for the first mover in this space. But the hundredth cryptocurrency with the perfect institutional design, mm. will they ever topple Bitcoin, even in this limited set of crypto markets? I'm sort of thinking of, we've got the QWERTY keyboard, not because it was the observably best design out there, but because of the level of adoption out the gates. And so is how much does path dependence cut against innovation in your in your understanding of this of this kind of narrow corridor that we can hopefully tread uh, I, I suppose it's, it's possible that you might get stuck um at a kind of suboptimal point you know we might end up with the vhs um you know but that's okay you know it's <laughs> vhs was good you know it's a lot of, oh, many a lot of everyone's childhood VHS. um but it's uh <laughs> Uh, the, um, well, I mean, what, what I, what I, what I say, okay. So when it comes to Bitcoin, um, I, I think you, you got to like it, it split like two things. This is where you're kind of dealing with like, where's the value going to be? And also like, where's the, this is where the action is going to be, because it's quite possible that Bitcoin is where the value is always going to be. It might just be the currency. It can't be the platform. It can't be the video streaming platform. Um, that's just impossible with, you know, with what it is. So, um, and, and I don't think it's probably, you know, I think if you're designing it now, you probably wouldn't design it quite this way. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that, um, that, that there isn't going to be an enormous growth in the, in the ecology of, um, of, um, the, um, of, of the system. And some of these things will just, will be the sort of thing that just require upgrading, or that require more, you know, sustained engagement. And they will have to have some kind of different, um, uh, selection mechanism uh, in, 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 in them. So, um, so if you're thinking, um, but I think a lot of people think, well, I want to know where to put my money. And, you know, as academics, we don't have to worry so much about that. We're just sitting on the sidelines when it comes to, you know, kind of in, in investment strategies. Um, it's not necessarily the case that the most useful platform is actually going to be the most valuable in terms of like where the, you know, um, uh, and, and one thing I, I kind of think with Bitcoin is kind of interesting is, um, is there are so many derivatives of it now so that you can kind of, you know, like, like it, it, you normally have to have somebody who's willing to take custody of the Bitcoin in order for this to happen. There normally has to be an individual, though they're trying, to, they're trying to get that away somehow. But you can, you can store your Bitcoin somewhere 
have it issued as a different token, usually on the Ethereum platform. So it's like a, 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 a uh, it's like T Bitcoin or W wrapped Bitcoin is like uh, what, what one of them. There's some contract risk associated with it can, compared to actually holding Bitcoin. But suddenly you can exchange Bitcoin over the Ethereum network or you can exchange, you know, something that is pegged to Bitcoin very, very closely. Um, although it wasn't because at one point increased in value because it became transactionally much easier to use. So people wanted it. And so it, it, it was worth, your, your WBTC was worth that plus the cost, which was actually quite a lot of converting your Bitcoin into WBTC. But it was kind of, um, um, so, so in that sense, um, some of these upgrades can like leverage the value that's already in Bitcoin and kind of, you know, so it might well become some kind of reserve currency. I, you know, not that useful for everyday transactions, but very, very helpful to kind of have in reserve for like, oh yeah, no, I've got this. I can put this up as collateral. It's like, it's all, you know, it can kind of um, be, um, you know, so, so um, uh, I, I think there's probably a lot more scope for, for com combinations of blockchains rather than this sort of like, oh no, it's, this one's dead, new one here, new one here, that, that kind of thing. They might swallow each other up a little bit, but they're kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of more inclusive than, than rivalrous in some respects. I like that. I think I might have seen a hand from Larry. Is that a... I forget what it was. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and, and I think another point to be made is also, oh, Sharmila, go ahead. Yes, I do have one. Sorry. Hi, Nick. How nice. Are you? Thanks for coming, Sharp. Okay. Um, my question is going to be very specific because, you know, I work in the health sector. Mm. Um, so, I've been working for the Minister of Health in Brazil, and the two issues, the first one is that we want to use real-world data from patients. So, I don't know how much you know about how blockchain has been, uh, is being implemented within the NHS or health sector, mm -hmm. but there is this goal of accessing people's health data on on the spot so as it happens mm. so they can they can send in whatever they want not only medical data but whatever it is that it's also relevant regarding the technology that they're using or the mm. the disease that they have um that has well there, there have been people talking here about how to use blockchain because within health economics there's like informed decision making Mm. And they they won't use that to access uh, like um, well confidential data from patients yeah. and yeah. while doing the health economics uh, decision making or the reports. So how how have you seen any of that, or how it could be useful, or do you, have you seen it happen in other spaces? Like because it's for decision making. But they're using mm. the ideas to use health medical records or whatever it is via blockchain to access that data just so that people are aware that it's anonymized but it's being used used on the spot just so that we don't have to wait for data to be published uh, or you know it's very hard to access um well database within ministry of health and stuff like that yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that is a possible use case. I wouldn't look to the NHS right now as a as an innovator in, in the space. It's not it, I gave it as an example of, of something that a public health system could look towards. Um, so I mean, like one, one, one example that, that I, I kind of so you know, I have I have a COVID app on my on my phone after I had a, a COVID scare. Um, it's very, you know, it, it, it's a wonderfully um, ambiguous illness that you kind of get because it's so close to so many other things if it's like not that serious but um so so i, I report to um was this uh, voluntary this is a uh, um well it was strongly encouraged but it was um yeah no it is voluntary uh, it might eventually not be um it's a trusted third party it's like um my um well actually sorry there are multiple parties involved so in fact there's a lot of stuff i don't trust about this thing but it's it's got a brand King's College, London, and I think John Hop Johns Hopkins. So I go like, oh, well, you know, they're all right. Um, Shah knows that, that King's was, you know, it might, might be one of your, it might be, um, you know, your, your predecessor or something, Shah, Shah, who's looking at it at King's even, you never know. Um, but in, 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 that, 
um, I, I, and what it is, is that obviously it's sharing my private, you know, they have my name, they have my address, they have my, um, they have everything. Um, and it's very useful data and whatnot. And they're doing it to try and track COVID, see what symptoms are like, see what symptoms, what sort of symptoms people are getting that is not COVID, like not identified as COVID, but, but going through the population. Oh, you know, try and get some patterns and that kind of thing. So live data, like you're saying, it's like live data for this like, uh, you know, desperate public health um, uh, public health uh, crisis that we're in. Um, and, um, uh, you know, at some point, I suppose it's inevitability, you know, since there's so many parties it's going through, it's going to get leaked. And some of that data, you know, we don't really want leaked, that kind of thing. It will be stolen or, or it will be misused or it will be put up on a server or something um, and then taken and then there'll be a scandal, you know, and hopefully it won't mean very much, but, you know, there's always, there's always a risk associated with it. Now, if you were running this on a protocol that was well designed, you could have a way of doing this where um, you can report things like your GPS location, you can report your symptoms, you can report, you can have your name like, but sort of hashed out so it can't be, you know, you know, it, it can't be de-anonymized without it. Um, and what you could do is you could have a system which will tell people whether you've been in contact with someone um, in your location. And the protocol will know it automatically. And, and it doesn't even have to report back to the people where these, where these contacts are. The protocol will know, the individuals who might be affected will know, but the, the public health people, they're gonna have to ask, you know. So in terms of like uh, making data, so basically keeping, keeping the fact that you've, ma making the fact that you've been exposed um, available to you, while, ma while keeping every potentially sensitive feature of your life private is a possibility with something like, with something like a, a blockchain protocol. Um, uh, that's, that, that would involve quite a lot of sophisticated thinking about how to, how to kind of establish that. But I, I, I do think that you know, a more realistic thing, you know, something that I was like looking at with that, with that slide, would be just to have a blockchain secure database which means you need a specific code to access each record. You can interrogate that database for like, uh, to produce results. Like, so, you know, on a kind of collective level, you can't look at individual records if you're doing that. Um, but you can make use of all the individual data, like to, uh, to generate your, you know, your real time results, uh, as, as you say. Um, and you don't have to necessarily make it so that only the patient can access the record, because sometimes that's not going to work, but you can make it so that maybe the doctor, you know, certain authorized users can, they have a particular signature which they use to access your actual personal data. And more, more than that, the, the, the database creates a record that it has been accessed. And if it's changed, like if it's updated with some notes, you know exactly when and why it was, it was added and who authorized it. Because I think part of the problem that people find at the moment is that, you know, like these, these records, they're kind of messy more than anything else. Like they have like data added to them at various points and no one quite knows where it kind of went on. You know, was it a doctor who was having an off day or a nurse who maybe made a mistake, made a, a case of identity? You know, it'd be very helpful to know exactly when and how these, these records are updated. So, so you want them to be secure, maybe not perfectly secure because, you know, like if you're unconscious, you don't want people to be like, oh, what was their what was their code to get in? You need you need people to be able to access it, but you do need to have. But it is useful to be able to have like this 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 kind of um, this final record of how it's being accessed and changed. I think that that would actually give a lot more accountability to the way data has been using. And if it, and, and if it's like um, cryptographically secured, then you're free um, to interrogate it as a research scientist and take you know take your those real time results as you want. And the the whole thing is is you know the, the you don't have to access the individual records at all to do that. So I can imagine a system like that being, uh, being very helpful. And I think it'd be great for everyone. It would like give much more data to researchers. We wouldn't have to worry about all this getting consent every time you wanted to do something. It just wouldn't be, it just wouldn't be relevant. Um, you'd only need consent for actually accessing those, those personal files. And it, and it would be much more accountable for people. And I often think like, um, you know, there are health services in, in countries with harsh immigration restrictions that want to access 
you know, like they, they want to access hard to reach people. But these people are worried that, you know, well, I, I can have a health record, but that health record has my address, it has my relationship, my relations, um, you know, lots and lots of useful data that in, in, the, in Britain's case, the home office would just love to kind of come in, hoover up and use to round up some people that are, that are, in, that are um, I I illegally in, in place. But the health system doesn't really care about that. You know, the health system is full of doctors who just want to help people. Um, and what they need is a system which credibly says, oh, no, we, we don't, we have, there's no way of hoovering up this data. It's, it's, it's just not possible. Um, so that, that, that's the sort of thing that I could, I could look forward to. Um, and it's good, it's good for states. It's good for states that can credibly commit to secure personal data because it means that you can trust them more. So we're actually past our second uh, nominal deadline, but oh wow, okay. I've, I've been in, no, I've been enjoying this conversation so much. I'm actually running late for a three thirty commitment, um, but so I have to step away. But I, I, I do not want to quash what is a very productive discussion. So I'm I'm going to leave. But I believe, given that we have other co-hosts, including you, Nick, this will stay open.